Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Art Speak Online. I'm Boots Herrera, Director and Chief Curator of the Ateneo Art Gallery. It has been a while since we, um, since our last online session, I think that was around May, when we worked with Art Fair Philippines for the Art, the Art Talks program. And we are happy to be back. And um, this time, our Art Speak Online session uh, begins the series of um, artist talks that feature winners and shortlisted artists for the 2021 Ateneo Art Awards. Today we have three artists whose practice and works deal with the use of new media and technology and so um, the title of this session gives us perspectives in contemporary art on these different aspects of um, media and technology. And we have with us um, two shortlisted artists, Sidney Inhi and Miguel Lorenzo Uy, and one of the winning artists for the Fernando Sobel Prizes for Visual Arts, Christina Lopez. We also have with us um, one of the winning writers for the Purita Kahlo Ledesma Prizes in Art Criticism, specifically for the Philippine Star. It's our first time to invite a winning writer to work with us and moderate um, our, our Art Speak sessions. Um, we believe it's an important um, opportunity for them to converse with uh, contemporary uh, artists who they probably have worked with or will be working with in the future. And so to introduce our moderator, we have Ms. Scarlett T. Gamalinda, who is also a visual artist, a researcher, and an art teacher. She graduated from the University of Santo Tomas with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree and a Master of Arts degree in Cultural Heritage Studies. Carla is a fellow of the 2015 J. Elizalde Navarro National Workshop on Critical and Cultural Heritage Studies and is one of the curators selected for Proto Para Rethinking Curatorial Work, an exhibit that was part of the Curatorial Development Workshop of the Jorge Vargas Museum. Uh, before I pass on the, the screen to Carla, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of our uh, program partner, um, Mrs. Ada Ledesma Mabilangan, who's with us in the Zoom room. She's the president of the Kahlo Ledesma Foundation. So welcome, Ada. For, thank you for joining us today. So Carla, I give you the screen and please introduce our speakers and we look forward to an insightful conversation. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Ms. Boots. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ada. Good afternoon to everyone. Today, we will be talking about perspectives on contemporary art, new media, and technology. Uh, the role of the audience today here is important because you can contribute to the discussion by asking us questions or sharing comments through the chat box. So we encourage you to leave your questions in the chat box anytime during the discussion, and we'll answer them towards the end. So, so the best way to understand new media is to look at excellent examples of works. And we have here today artists Celine Lee, Christina Lopez, and Miguel Lorenzo Uy to show us how they employ technologies like 3D printing, coding, AI as a fundamental part of their creative process. They will give us insights on this fast evolving and very exciting part of the art industry. So first up, we have Celine Lee. Celine is a visual artist currently based in Manila, Philippines. Since the beginning of her artistic career, she has been producing works with the use of different materials and media, often focusing on process and materiality whether in the form of a painting, a sculpture, an embroidery piece, or multimedia work, 
she explores the ability of visual perception and spatial recognition to invoke concepts that extend beyond form. Celine has recently won an Award of Merit in the 2020 Philippine Art Awards and has held four solo exhibitions to date. She was shortlisted in the recent Ateneo Art Awards, Fernando Zobel Prizes for Visual Art, for her exhibition titled The Length and Breadth of Depth, held at the Underground last year. Great to have you here, Celine. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Carla, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for everyone, the AAG, and um, everyone here. Um, so I'd like to just share my presentation for today. So um, I titled my presentation as uh, New Plane, and I will be focusing on how I utilized 3D softwares to produce some of my works. Uh, New Plane, because this is one of the few ways one can start with working on their 3D projects by adding a single plane. And also, I guess how this is characteristic of how I see 3D softwares in my art making as a sort of new platform. And as we go over the slides, I'll be mentioning 3D software features while putting them in the context outside of a 3D workspace. Um, but before I begin, uh, I'd just like to, for everyone to know that I didn't actually study multimedia arts. Um, I have a degree in fine arts, majoring in painting at the University, the University of Santo Tomas. But I learned everything that I know now about 3D just by watching tutorial videos on YouTube. So for that, I'd like to thank the University of YouTube. Um, so I'd like to begin by revisiting my first uh, solo exhibition um, back in 2018 held at Art Underground Gallery in Mandaluyong, uh, which was uh, titled The Shortest Distance. Uh, the title was taken from a mathematical principle articulated by Archimedes, uh, which was that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Um, the show consisted of paintings and embroidery on either cloth. Um, the pieces in the show depicted typical scenes from where I live, which is at a central business district, and which is where I used to work before um, I became a full-time visual artist, where you know one sense of time is always apparent. Um, in, in a way, I tend to obsess over the idea of fleetingness and existence and non-existence. So for this show and in some of my works, I attempt to visualize not just a visual representation of time, but also in gestures like, uh, example, the gesture of embroidery itself. Mm, from the architecture of the buildings to the sidewalks, uh, a lot of these imagery prompted me to present them in such a me measurable way and at the same time juxtaposing them with the uh, quote-unquote organic such as the people around or the sky above us but also at the same time evaluating them in the process such as in the biggest piece in the show uh, entitled Current which represents waves of the open sea that instead of painting it as well, I wanted to show their coexistence and how things uh, interweave. Um, to explain the use of Ida cloth as a material, it's an open weave fabric typically used it for cross-stitching. Uh, to me, Ida cloth and actually the idea of cross-stitching itself is reminiscent of how we use grids on a map to pinpoint coordinates. Uh, I began this Ida Cloth series with the concept of the fabric of space-time in mind, which was typically represented as an, inter as an interwoven wireframe. Uh, the idea of how anything can be represented realistically just by strategic repetitions of dots, lines, shapes, is just fascinating to me. It's like atoms and how they make up 
make things up in the fabric of space time. Which I guess brings me also to the significance of utilizing 3D software uh, for my works. I often use it now as a sort of sketchbook. It has now become a new way of sketching for me. The pencil has now become a vertex and the stroke becomes the click and drag of a mouse. Um, so prior to uh, creating a cube of virtual spaces. Uh, prior to using 3D to produce pieces, I actually used it just for curation. Uh, to me, visualizing the gallery or, or the space that I'll be showing my works at is important for me both as a practical way of curating beforehand, but also to be able to play around with other potential ideas. Um, playing around with the architecture of the space also helps me think of what to do for a show. It just helps to have these spaces be replicated digitally overall. And then um, I'll be showing you just rendered images of um, the curations of my shows and how it actually turned out. Mm -hmm. This was for my third solo exhibition, A Surface. So, and then uh, using some of the features of the 3D just came afterwards um, as I learned more about the softwares. So in a way it was kind of by chance at first. Um, so that was the beginning of that. Um, now um, I'll be showing works that have developed over the course of my affinity using 3D. So add light uh, optical illusion. So this work is also a thread on eye cloth work, but with you know acrylic paint. Um, uh, it's uh, titled A Cube and the Shadow It Casts. So I'll be showing you how was uh, created. Um, this is another iteration of the said piece uh, titled Spatial Relations. Um, so this, uh, as you can see, as I move the object around or the canvas around, the shadows of the piece also changes. Um, I guess what's fascinating to me about 3D is that the physics is almost accurate, or maybe you can tweak some of it to make it accurate. So um, it's, it's in a way almost like it could almost be like the real thing, right? So there. Um, so we, the next up is sculpting, um, constructing to deconstruct. So I'd like to explain this by showing you one of my works that actually won me an award of merit from the Philippine Art Awards last year, which was also a thread on Ida Cloth work entitled Land. So the image of the piece was generated using 3D by selecting height map images of the terrain, particularly in the Rizal area, then adjusting the settings of the displacement and stitching it. I meant to use a color palette that resembled a Chinese landscape painting, particularly because I found that the process of control in creating such a landscape was similar to how the Chinese government has been manipulating our own country, specifically with the use of, specifically in the issue of uh, the, the territorial dispute over the West Philippine Sea, and in many ways at that, not just territorially. So I guess this is what I meant by constructing to deconstruct. Um, by knowing how to wield something, you simultaneously learn about its implications in the grand scheme of things. So first, just a detailed study of Earth to Mimi to Earth. So this is a similar process to land. Um, this is a recent work that I 
uh, made. And um, Um, this is the final uh, work, and this was in one of uh, iterations of my disinfection series, which I started during the lockdown, where I uh, remove, sort of remove, erase the dye from the abaca paper by putting on bleach. So it's like a painting, but also erasure at the same time. And I particularly used, I, I, mean, I mean, I wanted for it to look like it was uh, an image that was not here on Earth, like Mars, for example, but actually this terrain, this place is here. So animate. Um, so what I guess as I learn about 3D more, I learned to use you know, animation also for, for my works, motion and, and existence. Uh, so this is one of my works that exactly touch upon that. Uh, it's a, this one is a study of blue, a piece called blue. And what I did here was to uh, have an, a digital cloth and then digitally tearing it apart. And this, these are the fragments torn apart from it. And these models, I then ha had them 3D printed. So this is a combination of a thread on either cloth and the 3D printed parts, which is this. Um, well, you, you, as you can see, some some of my work, especially the Ida Thought series, um, although that it's sculptural, it, it has sculptural sculptural elements. It's not completely, you know, three D yet for me. So that's why I decided to use already three D printing for my works because I wanted to show its, you know, um, the three D aspect of it more. And in relation to animation, I'd like to also uh, present a collaborative collaborative project between uh, Miguel and I, which was entitled Dis "Disruption of Frequencies." This was shown <laughs> during a time when we had just recently um, finished lockdown, like August around August, I think, last year, and um, uh, this uh, show was created because uh, in, in, in such a way that it caters to how people were just stuck at home. And yeah, we I'll show you a video of a preview video, a walkthrough of the short version of frequencies. So basically, um, we just did a, a game out of the district gallery. Uh, so these, the, the works you see here, are actual works that we produce, and then the images we just transferred into this digital space. And yeah, uh, since I already have uh, the architecture of District Gallery, I, we just, Miguel and I just sort of made it together using Unreal Engine to make a game out of it. And during also this time, interestingly, to um, there are other artists or collectives that have also made such similar uh, exhibitions in like making a game out of an exhibition and also, I guess, vice versa. I'm sorry. Which uh, brings me to um, rendering uh, our reality and a visual reality. Um, uh, so my recent, this is my recent solo exhibition that got shortlisted in the Ateneo Art Awards. And 
So it was entitled The Length and Breadth of Depth. And I'll be showing you uh, the official video of it so that you get to know the gist of my show. I've been wanting to release an all 3D printed objects solo exhibition this year. So for the length and breadth of depth, I was finally able to push through with the concept. Releasing it this year started out as a conscious decision without thinking much of its relevance. But now that the notion of space is starting to be redefined, especially in the context of exhibitions, I deem the idea fitting. What I mean by this is that galleries and museums are starting to look for ways to present works online, which is to say a virtual space, as opposed to the usual physical space. I wanted to interchange the idea of those two spatial concepts, so what I did was to have the actual canvases scanned and modeled, then 3D printed to be shown in the actual gallery space. The paintings which they were modeled by, on the other hand, are only viewable online. This show is my attempt at discovering what art means nowadays, especially visual art, where so much of its efficacy relies on just by looking at an artwork, even if it's filtered through our screens, where physicality is almost discouraged, thus leaving essence in obscurity. How can you truly grasp something, and can you actually do so? As a visual artist, I can't help but to ask myself these existential questions. So um, there, um, if you want to know more about this exhibition um, at any art gallery, you can see the like an in-depth um, process of it uh, at the Ateneo Art Gallery's video, which they produced. So there, I think that's about it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Maraming salamat, Celine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Celine. That was an interesting point when you said that you used 3D modeling as your, the 3D modeling program as your sketchbook since the capacities and limits of the medium influences how you think about the form, right? So like how we, uh, how the choice of our language, for example, affects how we build ideas. Yeah. So in yeah. a way, yeah. new media creates new ideas. Yeah, right. exactly. That's, that's great. So Celine's work in the length and breadth of that separated and then interchanged the physical experience and the visual essence of an artwork really making us feel this palpable loss. So now we ask, what is it that we lost when, we, when the camera and the screens made, us, made, made the artworks um, infinitely reproducible? So to complicate Celine's idea of the disparity between the virtual space, the virtual essence, and the physical space, uh, one of the works of our next speaker, Christina Lopez, studies how the invisible technology can become tangible. So Cristina Lopez is a visual artist based in Manila. She was granted a residency at the Royal College of Art in London, where she began focusing on controversial subjects such as the uh, extrajudicial killings in President Duterte's war on drugs. She also participated in a solo exhibition in Hong Kong and several group exhibits around Metro Manila. Her practice ranges from traditional forms to new media. She recently won the 2021 Ateneo Art Awards Fernando Zavell Prize, Prize for Visual Art for her solo exhibition, Portraits Proxies, held at the Drawing Room in Makati last March. We are excited to hear about your works. Good afternoon. Christina. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. Uh, so this is a photo taken from the exhibition that was shortlisted for the Ateneo Art Awards. Uh, I don't really want to repeat uh, what I already talked about in the video. And I, I think it doesn't make it, I might just end up being super redundant if I try to dissect the works one by one. But uh, I, I'll try to talk more about the process as to why uh, I decided to talk about these things and why I decided to use these formats. So my the, b before uh, I started working on the show last 2019, uh, I was really paranoid. So I guess, I mean, it, it might sound selfish. Uh, a lot of my work comes from a feeling or, or a sentiment I have. And it's usually something paralyzing or, or something scary. But for me, like what, what helps me moving forward as a person or, you know, just to keep existing is I like to make theories or I, I like to try to divine why I feel so dreadful. And the reason why for this show, I use a lot of material that is uh, intangible or, but, the reason why I like to use that is because for me, the structures that make me feel paranoid were designed to become intangible, but they're actually tangible and they affect us materially. Like they, ha they have material effects in the physical world. So uh, to, to give a brief background about myself, I'm not really a classically trained artist. Uh, I didn't study fine arts. I actually took a pre-med in college as my first degree. So for the longest time, my idea of art was not really, you know, making this exhibit in a grand institution or uh, trying to make beautiful things or objects to be placed on a wall or hung. Uh, my idea of art was just drawing or painting with my cousins. So the photo on the left is a painting I made when I was six or seven, I think. Uh, it, it, like I just really made art for fun and I didn't think it was anything special. Uh, and then when I was in college, I took a pre-med because when you grow up in a Filipino Chinese household, you, you tend to do what is expected of you. It's either you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or you're an accountant. So uh, I decided to take a pre-med. And during that time, most of what I was doing, like in terms of art, was just making really nice notes. Like when you would have anatomy class, my classmates would like to get a copy of my notes because they wanted to do the drawings or something like that. And at the same time, you know, while I was studying pre-med, I was also doing freelance work. So advertising, uh, and this continued until I dropped out, no? But uh, while I was in pre-med, I also joined the digital art competition, which is ironically, and well, it's kind of serendipity. Lang. Uh, the contest was actually by ACTM, which is an Ateneo org, I think. And it, it's, it's just a small competition. But well, uh, when I was looking through my photos, I was just trying to trace back where things went. Uh, anyway, these are some of my... Uh, recent interests. So just the stuff I save on my desktop. Uh, medyo malabo, no? Uh, parang nonsense. Pero what, what I like to do kasi is to look at how conspiracy theories are made. And to and I read a lot of sci-fi and also occult books. Like nandito si Alistair Crowley. And then there's Laguna Copper Plate, which I was recently looking up kasi we're moving to Laguna. And then nandiyan yung uh, engraving ng witch trials, which for me is very connected to primitive accumulation and, and connects to how I see technology today. So some of these interests I had when I was young, like from a very early age, I was already interested in these things, I mean, especially the Bible, because I was raised Catholic. But uh, some of these also, I just came across them because they were recommended by friends. I'm very lucky to have friends who recommend me things or who just send me things they think I might like. Uh, and a few of these a few of the theories you can find in these texts or in these stories 
uh, I will talk more about later. So this is a very crude attempt to uh, explain how I make work. Uh, in terms of magic, uh, I'm, I'm super interested in how things are hidden or obscured. So like appear, disappear, but also in terms of abstraction, like, I'm interested in how things are manipulated or how shapes are changed or how forms are disguised. Uh, in terms of technology, I like to see how progress is made or if it really is progress. Like oftentimes when people champion technology, they say it's for progress. Like if there's collateral damage, you know, they say it's in the name of progress. But I like to think about it as a way of, uh, parang is it really progress or are we just regressing? And I, I think some forms of technology actually become imperialist and fascist in nature just because we cannot escape them. Like we are forced to adapt or forced to live with it, live with the consequences. Uh, and that brings us to reality, which is the digital and physical effects of technology and magic combined. But uh, for me, kasi the digital and physical worlds aren't separate. Like for me, they're, they're just one thing. And a lot of my anxiety or paranoia actually comes from uh, theories about individuality and how we are perceived. And I think, you know, I, I am just as anxious about my physical presence as I am about my digital presence. So here, Alistair Crowley says, magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. So, uh, and Arthur C. Clarke says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So for this is how I see uh, the relationship between magic and technology. Uh, but also, any sufficiently advanced artwork is indistinguishable from a scam. And I don't just mean like scam in terms of value. But for me, like my artwork is kind of a grift or a scam because I just see art as a means to create a fictional world or, or to, to test theories that I can't test in real life or to talk about things I want to talk about. You know, because I'm not Elon Musk, like, like I can't change the world or do anything like that. But at least I, through exhibition spaces and through projects, I'm able to talk about these things more. So after I dropped out of pre-med, I actually started working in advertising. And that was when I became exposed to these terms. So uh, metrics, KPIs, uh, managing social media accounts, you come across these terms a lot. Uh, what, what amazed me about, you know, when, when we were pitching, we would have to come up with these personas. And what, what, what's so interesting to me is they're so detailed, but they're also so generic. And then I think uh, a lot of you are familiar with some of these headlines. So these are just some of the issues surrounding uh, AI, face recognition, uh, fake news, etc. But uh, aside from like talking about the technology itself or how the technology works, for me, what's also important is to look at the corporations and company like the, the companies that are actually allowing these things to happen uh, and to look at how they work with uh, governments and uh, when, when it comes to identity you know, uh, we always try to act as an individual or perform as an individual online but I'm very anxious about this because for me it's kind of pointless when uh, it's not even our own individuality. Uh, they, they, it's already owned and privatized by someone else. Like we're, that's why we're proxies. So that's why when I was making the work, uh, the, the reflection of a person actually turns into numbers. Because like, like how we're just perceived as data, you know, stored in some server, we, we can't see. 
And when it comes to trolls, that's why I decided to do an ID generator about trolls because we, when we talk about trolls, we often say we have to starve them or that they're fake and, and we, we yell at them for online for being fake. But actually, I don't really agree with uh, starving trolls. Because the reason why they exist is because of the gig economy and because they need jobs. Uh, and I, I also don't agree that uh, this information can be solved by fact checking alone, because we need to ask also who will be doing the fact checking. Like, will it be Facebook again? Facebook, who already worked with Cambridge Analytica before. I know they've already started to take down uh, troll accounts, but it's also funny to me because recently, uh, my, my accounts have been flagged for troll-like behavior. So it seems like uh, instead of just punishing trolls now, Facebook is actually encouraging you to perform more, to, to act more real. But, but you have to ask again, is, is, is this realness actually your own likeness or is it just the data that's going to be used for metrics for advertising companies and et cetera? So this is an extension of that work, which I made uh, in collaboration with the Artists for Digital Rights Network. I think Mac is here. Hello, Mac. So uh, please check out the publication. It's a really good publication. Uh, the work here was an extension of the show in Drawing Room. So for, for this work, uh, I, I drew a portrait of Mandy. So Mandy is a fictional character. And uh, I trained a text generator, GPT-2, because I can't get access to GPT-3. Uh, I, I couldn't get access to GPT-3 because it was purchased by Microsoft. So that's another example of primitive accumulation and uh, another form of enclosure, but yeah. So uh, not that I'm saying that we should uh, fear technology you know, or, or just go back to being primitives. I, I don't think uh, that's the case and I don't think that's what we should do. So to, to demystify it a little, uh, this is a portrait of a GAN, a generative adversarial network, which is what I used for the show. Uh, the GAN is just uh, a simple way to utilize pattern recognition. Uh, it's not some terminator that's going to take over the world and eliminate humanity. So actually, when I was trying to create the portraits of the trolls, my only job was to collect and filter the data set. And after I had that data set, uh, I was able to feed it through the GAN. So the GAN is just a class of machine learning systems and it consists of a generator and a discriminator. So basically there's one guy who tries to, let, let's say I fed it Picasso paintings. Uh, the generator will try to make fake Picasso paintings and the discriminator will try to check, oh, Papa Sabato or Moha Paring fake, you know, something like that. So that's just how GANs work. Uh, and I think most of the fear surrounding uh, AI, uh, you know, GPT-3 is another type of uh, AI, but uh, I think most of the fear surrounding it is just Silicon Valley being afraid of its own ghost. Like, uh, like in the anime Angel's Egg, which is the photo on, the right, on my Zoom background right now, uh, and she looks at her own reflection in the water. I think that's what's happening because it's Silicon Valley people, uh, it's Cambridge Analytica, it's a government. Uh, they're the ones using AI as a means to an end. It's not really the AI itself acting this way. So I think when they stigmatize it or act so fearfully around it, I think they're just afraid of what they're doing. Uh, and I, I actually think sometimes that we have a lot in common with automata, with AI, because, you know, they are used as a means to an end. Uh, and they, they're just seen in terms of profitability. So are you able to perform your function? If not, tap on, yeah, something like that. 
Uh, when it comes to technology, again, I'm not against new technology. Uh, I just think we should question, uh, question issues surrounding it, question how the technologies are made, and question why they are made. So uh, in 2018, uh, I made work about Bitcoin, but I think since then, it's just become more and more uh, famous. So uh, on the right is an old work, on the left is a recent work, which was exhibited in Art Informal this year. Uh, to further expound on the work. So the work was about the Tagabulag. So yung Tagabulag, isa siyang anting-anting na pinasa daw ni Gregorio Aglipay kay Ferdinand Marcos. So yung galing daw ng anting-anting na ito ay yung Pambubulag. So hiding, hiding the person. You know, in, in, in this description, I don't really know if it's hiding the person or hiding the person's wealth. And if it's equated, you know, something like that. But what's interesting to me is uh, the Tagabulag somewhat acts similarly to Bitcoin and how Bitcoin works. And it actually acts similarly to what's happening now, like hidden wealth. Uh, it's all over the news now because of the upcoming elections. So it makes me question things like uh, about obsolescence and uh, about if we're actually moving forward or just repeating the same thing in another format. My problem with uh, Bitcoin and in now recently NFTs, my problem with these technologies is actually how they replicate the physical world too much and they already, they're just repeating what is already happening. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're exactly the same, no? I think that there's some potential, some emancipatory potential when it comes to the blockchain or when it comes to the certificate of authenticity that somewhat comes with NFTs. But I, I think there's potential there. But the way it's behaving right now is actually just similar to another stock market or just another platform or extension of the already existing art market. So I think in order to truly realize the potential of these technologies, we need to look further. Maybe we need more imagination or uh, maybe we need to talk to more people and collaborate more. It, it's sad because there are actually alternatives, but uh, since the hype when it comes to these technologies mostly surrounds big companies, big corporations, or big coins, uh, the alternatives aren't put into the spotlight. So to reach the end of the presentation, I just want to share a quote from the Sino Feminist Manifesto. Uh, digital technologies are not separable from the material realities that underwrite them. And then uh, in, in one part of this quote is something I really believe in. Like, I know it's very negative, like how, how I've been talking this whole time. But for me, the negation actually gives me hope. Because the reason why we negate things is because we want things to be better in the future. So I think the more people are able to point out the flaws of these things, the more we are able to move forward. So with that being said, uh, I actually don't think art making exists in a vacuum or I, I don't really think it's just about me as an individual producing work. For me, in order to learn more about what I want to talk about, uh, I actually have to step outside of art making. And sometimes this includes, or art making for my own sake. So th sometimes this includes uh, working with the AI as a collaborator. So in one of the guide questions, Ateneo asks us if there are people assisting me in my work or who do I work with, ganyan. So I actually see uh, AI as a partner, like not just as a tool, 
compared to how how uh, most corporations see data analytics, uh, I don't really see it that way because for me, the AI is able to teach me things that I don't know. You know, because it's pattern recognition and it's able to show me things that I wouldn't have picked up right away. Uh, and sometimes uh, collaboration also involves working with other artists such as Leslie, Nash, and Elephant. Uh, but more importantly for me, uh, art making or learning in general uh, is really outside of the exhibition space or is really uh, outside of the production of work alone. Uh, so uh, I, I'm part of Resbap and Tambi Sansasini. And for me, joining organizations like this has really helped me deepen my understanding of the world and of my own practice. So if you guys want to donate or join Tambisan, just send me a message. And sorry, like I'm, I tend to go off tangent a lot and I talk really fast and in a disconnected manner. So if you have any questions, please leave question, uh, please leave them in the chat. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Christina. Thank you. That was an interesting point about collaboration. Later on, maybe we can expound on that. One of the ideas that Proxy's portrait suggests, the exhibit of Christina earlier, uh, is that technology has an identity. Ang ganda ng description mo, like one that is simultaneously generic and detailed. So the exhibit bears an unseen God for us to criticize, like staring back at uh, the central tower of the Panopticon with defiance. Galing. For me, it's so brave because we share your paranoia. It reminds me of the study of my friend Jay Hore about the demons in the ceiling paintings of Ray Francia in the churches of Bohol. I'm not sure if I remember his point accurately, but we... Artists painted the demon's image so that they could have an identity and thus be addressed. So now that we are in the topic of identity and God, uh, quite providential, our third speaker, uh, Miguel Lorenzo Uy, investigates the intersection of identities of God, man, and technology in one of his recent works. Miguel Lorenzo Uy is an artist working and living in the Philippines. He works with different mediums from painting to photography and sculpture to video. His works revolve around immediate concerns with regards to beliefs, technology, and media. He was also shortlisted in the 2021 Ateneo Art Awards Fernando Zobel Prizes for visual art for his exhibition, I Am That I Am, held at the underground early this year. Great to have you here, Miguel. Good afternoon. Hi, hi, Carla. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, sige, uh, start na ako sa aking presentation. Mm. Okay, so hello, everyone. Uh, I tried my best to make my Art, art practice as comprehensible as possible because uh, my art practice and train of thought are somewhat non-linear. So this presentation is an attempt to narrate my experiences parallel to my practice, how I've arrived at this point. I hope you get to understand more of my body of work and art practice through this presentation. So to start a brief background about me, I've been exhibiting since 2016, and as for my educational background, I first studied painting. I majored in painting at the University of Santo Tomas in 2011, before shifting and graduating with a degree in multimedia arts in Benilde last 2018. Uh, after graduating last 2018, I briefly worked part-time as a multimedia artist for a ga gallery named 1335 Mabini. It's based in Makati and Manila. 
but not right now they only have the Mahati branch open. Uh, there I documented artworks and exhibitions and designed catalogs and in print format and digital format as well. Uh, I also had the role in creating social media posts, scheduling them, writing the captions. I was very fortunate enough to be working with great colleagues and gallerists who are very knowledgeable with not just the art scene here, but in other parts of the globe as well. As I've worked here in 1335 Mabini, I've met a lot of great artists, curators, and collectors as well. This is one of the places that I got to learn more about contemporary art aside from Instagram and YouTube. But after a period of time, I decided to quit my part-time job and give more time and dedication to art. But presently, right now, uh, I also work as a freelance photographer and videographer. So aside from being a visual artist, I also document works for artists and gallery here in Metro Manila, which I think became a necessity, especially during this time where everything is transitioning to digital. It becomes essential for galleries to extend the experience of exhibitions to the digital realm. So different sources of income like uh, documentation of exhibitions, uh, designing books and catalogs have also become important for me to sustain my practice, which deals with different materials and media which are not all really feasible in, in a financial sense and are also very expensive, especially during this time. Now that I've introduced myself, I'd like to tell you more on my works as an artist. So during the beginning of my practice, my interest was, my main interest was in how religious beliefs had played a major role in our ad identity forming, both indiv individually and collectively. So being born Filipino and being raised as a Catholic, we are considered to be the only westernized and Christian nation in Asia. That fact and generalization had a big influence on my work and thought process. I couldn't ignore the fact that my actions and decisions are informed by beliefs that are rooted in a, colon in a bias of colonial influences. Um, I've had my frustrations with relig religious institutions, conservatism, in a sense where politics is involved Example of these are like, uh, if you remember, uh, exhibition was taken down at the CCP and also the controversial passage of the RH bill, which the institution has lost a lot of influence because of that controversial issue. Um, and with those as my biggest influence or interest, or should I say frustrations and disappointments, I became interested with the metaphor of light. The symbolism of light is so encompassing for, and universal from ancient literature to today's blockbuster movies. Light can reveal the truth and at the same time, it can also blind us. I explored light as a material and a tool, a medium and a language. So a brief background about this piece. This sculpture was made in collaboration with a sculptor from Paete Laguna. The place is famous for making santos and urnas, the vitrines, the vitrines that contain the santos. And I commissioned him to create one house, to create uh, an urna to house a lighting, a neon lighting fixture. So the neon lighting fixture was fabricated by an advertising signage maker. I also commissioned him to create one for me. Uh, so I thought the title as fitting as to how I was inspired by a case study by, I don't know if you know him, uh, a famous ethnographer, Felix Landa Hocano, where he observed that people go to specific places I mean, Filipinos go to specific places of pilgrimage to perform prayer and ritual to ask for a favor and, or like a solution to their problems that 
no one can help them with but the supernatural. But uh, this comes with ano, a catch. They they would have to promise something to the to the santo. They would keep like for example, they would devote their one day of a of their year every year going to that going performing a ritual there in the place. Uh, so I've produced other pieces exploring the potential of light in my, the beginnings of my practice, like this small installation I did way back in 2018. That's not way back. Um, the prism acts as a lens dividing the white light into different colors while projecting abstract light image light images onto the black blank in stack films. I would say that this piece is somehow an experiment in terms of looking for a certain unexplainable experience. This paved the way to further exploring the potential of light for me as a material and as an experience. Then to my first opportunity to mount a solo exhibition. Uh, it's called Adding Negatives. Uh, my first solo exhibition touches the notion of the eye as a center of perceiving reality and how light enables it. This was the next step of my bigger exploration, my bigger and deeper exploration of another dimension of light like how it calls everything to existence. So in uh, other photographs, uh, these photographs that I developed with the help of the sun, placing objects like lens filters, prisms, negatives and papers rolled in different shapes and slowly moving them with each color developing onto the paper. So different. I wanted to show how light forms the image when it is sunny or cloudy, for example. So these are prints developed in different weather conditions. When producing this body of work, it was, it was amazing to see how the sun developed the exposed paper, leaving the shadow behind. Like the title, I am somehow adding negatives to the paper. So I was exploring, I was into exploring light as a material and a symbol. There came a time and an opportunity where I was asked if I could assist and coordinate for an artist based in New York to help him with his research on BPOs and night shift workers. BPOs like call center, mga ganun. The, uh, his name is... I don't know if I can, it's okay. Uh, Danilo Coriale. The first leg of his research was in India, a country also with a big BPO industry. Then he came here to the Philippines, which also has one of the biggest BPOs, BPO industries in the world. So we conducted interviews with workers on the night shift, learning about their daily or nightly, nightly lives their benefits from the job and also, most importantly, their frustrations. Since, since it was a kind of a photography-based work he has to produce, we photo-documented sites in different BPO hubs, like in Mall of Asia, Eastwood City, UP Techno Hub. I took the, this picture as we rode an FX from one of the respondents' house to experience their daily or nightly commute to work. During the course of the research project, we met with unions, different unions and progressive groups concerned with the welfare of the workers and had, and we also attended an event they co-organized. I was so moved by the fact that they all have this idealistic drive to fight for what is just and right. And it has become such an eye opener for me this very event opened my eyes to the reality and injustice happening among this sector of society, which before I thought most were not doing well because they themselves are the ones to blame. It's so much more complicated than that. Um, they are victims of the system and 
to experience threats of death and displacement is something that you should not um, take lightly or you should be addressing. Um, so my approach to art making has always been in flux. It has become parallel as with how I cope and make sense of this society, which is so fast paced in a sense that it's so difficult to keep up and process things that are happening around me since I could experience everything, not well, everything simultaneously. So I came up with this work, three channels. Uh, it's my attempt to deconstruct the screen. The, I shot three YouTube videos of world leaders swearing their oath, which was broadcasted live worldwide. Zoom into the pixel and therefore becoming abstracted. I thought of the idea of light from the screen becomes more dazzling than the light that shines the truth. Uh, next, I was given another chance to mount a solo exhibition. So this is my second solo exhibition. And what in my interests were at the time were in the book I came across. It was called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. So basically what I got from this book was how civilization flourished through the discovery of different elements like fire and lightning and how these have changed our lives throughout time. So anyway, there's the fire and lightning technology in the way if you think about it. Um, I was really trained in traditional painting and I wanted to go back to the act and discover more of its potential for me as an artist. That I then realized that to paint is also to frame so my process was to take a very small part of a photograph I took and crop it and use it as my reference to paint a picture. So yeah, this very act is, I realize is parallel to how narratives are framed and information is filtered. I must say that this exhibition is somehow a transitioning time for me as I always find myself in a state of existential crisis. The title, Wind and Water, is loosely based and influenced from a book I was also reading at that time, if you're familiar with the Tao Te Ching. Uh, this is one of the fundamental texts of Taoism. I found it compelling to use the title, Wind and Water, as also it also reflects the state I was in during that time. Somehow just going with the flow amidst all the technological problems. And to me, looking back, uh, this has like got to be the most, I don't know, expressionistic or poetic show for lack of a better term. Um, another event that had me thinking about the purpose of art was when I was invited to be a part of a piece by fellow artist and friend Poklong Anading. Me and other artists were invited to submit an artwork to be installed within an artwork. So it's like an exhibition within an exhibition. From what I understood, this piece was initially planned to cover a portion of Manila Bay and block the view of the sunset. Which is Manila Bay, which is most famous in Manila Bay. Right? But I think the project is still in its infancy uh, and will soon cover the whole view of the sunset soon. Well, whichever comes first, right? is it the seawall or our real plastic waste? The concept of the seawall was about the consequences of plastic with our memory and I found it appropriate to create a book of archived objects made out of plastics while artistically recording how they are archived through video format. So, ito yung mga like, skinan ko. You can see the different plastics I scanned and I also categorized them to different functions like single-use plastics, 
mga ganun, etc. Another one, ito may lighter, functional plastics. So this is the video. It's like a lifeline or and a radar. You can see the scanned objects. Scan plastic objects. So, ito yung ano, still loading. This is how it looked like and how it was installed within the seawall. And it's not yet loading. You can see them. At, I, will, I will share my website later. You can see all my works there. Uh, so, you, yeah, you may access the progress of my archive, my plastic archive through my website. But the, yeah, it's not yet finished. And I also realized that this act of archiving all the plastics I have used and will be using will never end. Thinking about uh, going zero waste, it becomes another case where the burden is again put onto us, the ordinary people. I mean, yes, we could do our part in stopping this plastic problem by adopting a zero waste lifestyle. But what about those who continue to manufacture and, and to create plastics, to put them out, out in the market? I also thought of those who really are powerless and uninformed, what choice do they have? So after that, uh, the novel, novel coronavirus pa spiraled out of control and became a global pandemic. So with that, I was forced to rethink my art practice. Being stuck at home, we have been forced to experience the world through our screens. All sorts of interactions were carried out through the internet. So ito, another turning point in it became inevitable for me to watch how the government would handle the crisis. There had been a point last year, 2020, where a certain law, I'm sure you all know that, uh, was passed and everyone, including me, was so agitated. I mean, diba, parang gitna ng health crisis. Well, so, parang junya tato, we attended a uh, protest at UP Diliman. And it was a great sight as well amidst the pandemic. We, everyone was still united to criticizing this regime that masks itself as a savior and benevolent, despite all the fake news and threats of violence, you know, shoot them dead. So after that, uh, I think this is our most new media work, me and Celine. Um, so we developed this interactive digital exhibition. As galleries have resorted to digital exhibitions, we thought that existing platforms couldn't give justice to the physical experience. Parang, sorry, excuse me. Merong mga like platforms na pwede ka na lang mag-submit ng works tapos ayun, madali na siya anon. Pero like, we felt it didn't give justice to the pieces. So we thought of somehow simulating the experience with an interactive game-like format. These are some of the references, the photo references I used and through these images, I got to extract textures, textures like tiles and the walls. So ito, extract, I mean, Photoshop ko siya. Yung door, huminga ako ng floor plan sa gallery. Ayun, yung tiles rin, inarrange ko sila in a way na sa picture, sa actual space, ganun itsura, pati yung lights. So this is the rendition and you can download the game the program but it's still limited to Windows to the Windows operating system it's not yet available kung Mac gamit niyo we're working on that yeah
um, with a further transition to digital reality caused by the COVID pandemic, I felt that the digital space has become an oasis for us. Um, there are a lot of distractions and fictions for us to use and consume as an escape from reality. I created Mirage as a way to make sense of this digital transition or disruption. Um, I came up with this idea of a sense of hope amidst despair, somehow like a false oasis you see in a desert. Uh, a mirror created by the refraction of light on a, with, on a denser air within the environment. This phenomenon is usually seen in open horizons like open highways, plains, desert, and the open sea. Um, the mirage is a patch of simulated ocean waves, and I made the finish to mirror its, the reality it is situated in. In this case, I made a detailed rendition of the gallery space where it was shown. So 3D, kumara na akong 3D ng gallery space. Tapos nilagay ko yung computer-generated ano patch of ocean. So I don't know if you could see this. My internet is quite unstable right now. Um, as water is fluid, I wanted the, sorry. As water is fluid, I wanted the mirage to also adapt to different forms and shapes. This is another iteration of the mirage and this particular piece was exhibited in a new format organized by fellow artist and friend, Pam Quinto. I won't be diving much into the details, but you can search it in Instagram and it's called Parcel Exhibitions. So Serpent is a project I did together with my brother who happens to have a degree in computer science. So he's literate with pro the different programming languages. Um, we created a program that requires a microphone and in an internet connection and transcribes all audible words it can hear to text and records each in an Excel sheet. So it looks like this. The program is displayed on the screen, allowing you to see how everything works. The program requires an internet connection as it works with a database of open source libraries for transcribing words in different languages. In this case, um, Eng English at Filipino. Here is a sample of an excerpt from an Excel file, I have the words it transcribed. So, ayan, ganyan siya mag -ano. I thought of the title Serpent as a reference to the creature in the story of Adam and Eve. The serpent to me is like the algorithm that shows us our desires and making us consume them. For this work, my idea is to show how data collection works and this just, and as this is just um, a crude program with limited hardware, right? what more are the larger tech corporations capable of? So with the small data that I have on hand, I also attempted to turn it into another piece. Uh, to whisper it back to the audience through a fashion known as ASMR. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where the sound gives you a gentle brain stimulus or tickles your brain. Um, so as technology advances, information can be shared through different media platforms like social media. This show was my exploration on how to technology and media have become like an unstoppable force and a deadly political weapon. Ultimately, a god which we will forever depend on.
I'll just let you watch the video from the gallery where is where this was exhibited, produced by the gallery Underground Gallery, which, where this was exhibited. I hope you can also watch the video the Ateneo Art Gallery has produced, as it will be like walking you walking you through the exhibition. I am that I am. The God from the machine. The nameless. The, the limitless. limitless. I am the creator. The system. The one that governs all things. Every, Every deed, deed in, in the, the world, world will pass, pass and move, move through me. me. I am more than good and evil. I am the truth. The path to follow. I am beyond colors. Black and white. Beyond numbers and letters. I am the hammer that judges. The invisible hand that ushers. The contract that binds. And my will is uncontested. My, my wisdom, wisdom is absolute. absolute. I am everywhere you are. From the house you enter. The road you pass. The food you eat. The items you trade. The letters you write. The, the images, images you see. see. And the words you read. Even the people you meet. I know where your eyes look. Even the next word you will speak. I know all your pleasures and woes. Your happiness and your sorrows. The things you love. Than the things you hate. I understand them all. Your destiny is already preordained. For you are my beloved. You are my child. My love and compassion will shepherd you to paradise. All the knowledge you seek. You will find. All questions you ask will be answered. For there, for there is, is nothing, nothing impossible, impossible through me. Through me. Eternal, Eternal life awaits those who believe in me. me. So bound, bound to happen, you will be persecuted by the enemy. But you must never forget that you have nothing to fear. More than ever, you, you have, have nothing, nothing else to hide. For I am always with you. So, eto na, this is the last uh, slide. So, this is my recent and still ongoing exhibition. It will run until October 20, so I hope you can visit soon. It's at Finale Art File in Makati. As society turns into a probable dystopia, we present a video sculpture, one iteration of this project. Astral Prison embodies a society that has consented to plunder and pillage, deception and tyranny. All that is left is a life masqueraded and simulated as digital, posing as authentic and rendering everyone blind from reality. Imposed by the few people in power, the Astral Prison encompasses the physical, digital, and even the spiritual. It manifests itself as a prison without walls. It's warden, ruthless, and manipulative. The shackles and chains invisible and the sentence inherited generation after generation. It is our burden and our crime, the curse of being born, struggling and consuming to survive that we are given a life sentence. It is something that cannot be easily perceived, yet it is so evident, one that makes us believe we are truly free. Astral yeah. Prison and Finale Art File, right? Sa Makati. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember going back to your last exhibit, uh, The I Am That I Am. A few years back, my friends and I would toy with the idea that Google is God. Because it's mm -hmm. an all-knowing, all-seeing all entity. Mm -hmm. So seeing your work, seeing Miguel's work in, in that mm -hmm. exhibit makes me realize that, oh, I know, we, we are Google. So it adds another dimension. It's so if I resent technology do do i resent myself and do i resent the society that created it it's my society so hopefully it's the other way around and not resentment but he's correct thinking about this will mm -hmm. influence how we relate to technology and our daily lives so thank you thank you again celine christina and miguel for sharing your works with us so let's open the discussion to questions from our audience. Uh, hello to our audience. When 
you do send questions, please also say who you are and who the question is for. But while we're waiting for them to type in their questions, uh, can I start with the pain? Um, sorry, Carl, uh -huh. Carla. Um, one audience sent me a question. I see. Okay. So yeah, let's um, read so that I'm just first. gonna, I'm just gonna read it out loud. Um, it's from Rupesh okay. Sitharan. Uh, he, uh, firstly, thank you, Mr. Lindy. I am intrigued and inspired by your use of 3D software and fine art practice. I wonder how do you see the indexicality of the 3D virtual space heavily dependent upon depended upon the correlation of the physical. To some extent, it seems to limit the possibility a virtual space could offer on its own merit. Is a virtual space conceivable without emulating how we human experience uh, time or space physically through our senses? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I hope it's okay that I answer, I answer this publicly. <laughs> So um, yes, uh, for me, it's a matter of preference, I guess. I don't question the, I guess, the potential of 3D or virtual space as a, a new platform or even a way to produce work in itself. Uh, uh, I'll make an analogy. <laughs> like, I hope it's not too bad. So it's like having an apple, an actual apple and having an apple juice or apple juice concentrate. Um, you get, you get, um, it's both delicious, but then it's not. It's still not the same thing, right? So for me, I guess I just prefer the apple, which which is to say that I prefer maybe making work still in this physical um, way. And um, may, I, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but um, for my earlier works, um, I did that. I, I, I made use of the 3D and then translated it physically but then as I went on with using it like for disrupt disruption of frequencies for example I made a game or a virtual space entirely um, available in the virtual space so um, I feel like this maybe hopefully the aesthetic of let's say a wireframe in itself could already translate to hey that uh, that you know, image looks like something that was made using 3D. So I think it's a way to s sort of have this language in this sort of trying to keep a balance with visual language, you know, trying to articulate it in, in, in such a way that both uh, of these spaces uh, are acknowledged. So I, I hope I answered <laughs> the question so thank you thank you for the question Rupesh. a correction pala uh, you have to send the questions in the q a box i'm sorry i said chat box earlier we have another question for celine would you like to answer would uh, the question is from loreto apilado would you consider your work geometric abstract um yeah uh, some of it yes but uh, for the ones that are representational i guess no it's clearly i feel like um it i have i admit that i have influences from geometric abstraction it's i guess it's quite obvious but um but for like let's say land it's obviously obviously something that tricks the eye into thinking that okay, these are just a bunch of lines put together, but then um, in a, I mean, in a farther perspective or, or something, it's actually a form already. So yeah, I think, I, I hope I answered <laughs> your question. Thank you for Thank the you. question, Loreto. I have a question for all of you. So given the sparse new media art history in the Philippines, uh, how would you describe the reception of the local community for new media? So, siguro let's start with Christina Mona para makapahinga si Celine and then Miguel. Uh, so, I'm not really, parang when I describe myself, I don't really see myself as a new media uh, artist. I, I actually enjoy painting and drawing also. But, uh, 
I, I think the problem is not really with uh, new media itself uh, or the technology alone. Uh, I think we should also question the like how things can be easily accessed, uh, especially with how uh, my experience with the gun, uh, trying to access the technology itself was really hard because it was under copyright by, for GPT, it was Microsoft. Uh, for the style gun, it was NVIDIA. So those things, privacy policies uh, need to be looked into, but also uh, means for connectivity here in the Philippines. I think our Wi-Fi is really expensive, but uh, all of the telcos, like no matter what telco you're signed up with, like you, you always have problems. Na. So also that, but I think because of the pandemic, na, uh, a lot of things have shifted to existing online. So there, there's more tolerance, at least in, in that sense. Thank you, Christine. How about you, Miguel? What are your thoughts? Um, yung, I mean, new media in terms of uh, it being as a form of art, I think it's, the reception is, ano, okay yung reception niya to, sa people, pero um, I guess it's still not feasible as, ano, in terms of pag, economically speaking for us artists. Yeah, parang ganyan. What do you mean by ano, by economic economically speaking? Is it like economic sustainability or? Uh, yeah, or for it? me as an artist, kasi like um it's quite uh I mean yung support ng ano dito, medyo support from the government parang hindi masyadong hindi bigyan ng importance yung arts, I guess. So. Like, mahirap makahanap. I mean, mahal gumawa ng new media work. So, compared to painting, which is very, I mean, sobrang accessible na ng ano, ang daming mga art supply stores. Whereas new media, medyo, ano, sobrang konti pa lang niya. Yeah. I guess the support for new media and for something unfamiliar, no? Yeah. To, uh, to many people. Pero yung reception niya, very okay, okay yung ano niya sa audience. Yeah. The social traction. Uh, how about you, Celine? What are your thoughts dun sa reception of new media? Um, well, first of all, I think it's a question of existing spaces that cater to new media. Like, hmm. do we even have these? Um, well, most of um, the artists uh you know, have this platform of this white cube setting. But also, of course, they collectively and each are on their own have their own uh, ways to present their art, kahit virtually. Um, but for me, new media, it's, it's, parang, yeah, it's still like a niche market um, in, a, in a business sense of the gallery so like uh, I feel like if only I, I mean if you feel like artists now whether or not discreetly use new media um, it's just that I think the platforms are lacking in this in a sense for me in my opinion so uh, the reception will uh, <laughs> ano ba? Well, I think it's a uh, it's exciting. Well, it still it still limits it, it's still limited to like, let's say people who don't have computers, don't have phones. But uh, I guess it's another way to viewing art, not in a very inti- like often the not imit- in intimidating white cube setting, right? So yeah, <laughs> I guess that's it. Or, yeah. And I also relate to, I guess, Tona, that I don't consider myself actually as a new media artist because I do like really a lot of different stuff. Um, but I just incorporate, yes, uh, new media processes in my art. 
process of it. It's actually a weird term, no? Yung new media. Well, paano na 20 years from now? Oh. How How is it going to be called? Maybe you should think about like a new term for new media art that would really define what, what you're doing. Although, uh, yeah, the definition would be, you know, would also limit, siguro. So, let's see how it goes. And we we have another question from uh, the Q&A. So, it's directed to Celine, but if ever you see Miguel and uh, Tina can uh, contribute their thoughts, go lang. I am interested to hear, uh, it's from Errol, I'm sorry. Errol Gonzalez. I am interested to hear your perspective on the ex experience of your exhibit would be if the visitor did not have any data or cell phone to see the shadow paintings online. Thank you in advance for your answer. Ayan, related to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question. Um, yes, I guess this is exactly uh, my sort of frustrations as well with how visual art is viewed nowadays or like in general in in our art scene i guess it's it's still uh limited of course you can't be <laughs> and you can't be your art maybe uh or can never be or hopefully can be like omni omnipotent or something like um like no, it's so accessible to everyone, na. So yeah, I feel like well, uh, so yeah, I that's one of the limitations uh, with my exhibition. It's clearly limited to you know people who can only or only have computers and phones to view the paintings. So I guess that's another way of saying maybe, uh, well. If you don't have these platforms, then what you have left are these 3D printed objects in the physical realm that is missing something. Maybe that's also another conversation of, okay, um, uh, like, you know, if you only have this, you can entirely get, get a grasp or get a grip of the entire uh, exhibition or of a thing. Oh my god, I hope yeah, sorry. I hope that makes sense. It's partial. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Errol Gonzalez, for that question. Do, Miguel and uh, Christina, do you have something to add to the idea? Of parang our limitations, lalo na ng Filipino society na uh, maraming uh, lacking in infrastructure. Can we jump to ano, to the next uh, question that is related then? So what are the, the threats or, or the hindrances that you see in new media art bukod sa infrastructure? Do you, Like aside from the internet, not then aside from few people not having phones, what are the hindrances that you see? And while thinking about the answer for that, uh, let's answer the question of Loretta Apilado Olet. Uh, for all three, again, let's jump to the topic of NFT, which uh, Tina, Christina touched on briefly earlier. Do you consider yourselves going to NFT? Uh, or, uh, okay. Go, go, go. Okay, uh, okay, for me, um, parang sa ngayon, hindi muna kasi it's ano, not good for the environment. <laughs> kasi parang may nabasa kong article na sobrang kinumpare niya yung pag pag mint mo ng like NFT na, parang ano siya equivalent to a flight from London to Rome yata yung carbon emission oh. 
So like just one, medyo, no? one main thing. Average, average, average. So, yun yung average. So like parang hindi mo na ano, hindi siya ano. Given the situation today. Oo, uh, given the situation today na grabe na yung ano, climate ano, change. It's more dangerous because we don't see it. It's an invisible yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an invisible force. Not like plastics that there's something tangible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good but How about you, si Christina Muna? Uh, for me, actually, uh, the concerning what Miguel said, like yung environmental cost, no? Uh, I think that article, I think I came across it also. It was talking about uh, minting on Ethereum. So Ethereum has high gas fees, high gas fees, that's why uh, mm-hmm. it costs that much energy, though it's, you know, in a sense, hypothetical, but hypothetically, it costs that much energy to mint something on Ethereum. But it's like what I was saying earlier, you know, there are alternatives. So it's like comparing a mm-hmm. Hollywood movie to an indie movie, you know, we're talking about digital content here. So uh, one example is Tezos. So Tezos is a cryptocurrency uh, on, and the platform Hikepna for NFTs runs on Tezos. And a few Filipino artists' friends I know actually sell NFTs on that platform. And w- when I was talking to them about the environmental concerns, they told me actually uh, Hikepna and Tezos, they like the green alternative to, let's say, Rarible or OpenSea. Uh, but I think uh, personally, Uh, I'm still studying how to do NFTs properly. You know, like, like I said earlier, it's just become another replication of the existing art market. But I really do want to get paid. <laughs> And I, I think the attachment of the sort of COA, yeah, you know, the non-fungible token is not actually the image, right? Like it's minted on the blockchain. Mm. And the non-fungible token is basically a link. So it's it's not exactly, but I'm still studying the technology. But but I think there's tech, there's potential in how we can guarantee authenticity, and how we can guarantee payment. And I think it's also interesting to think about how there can be many owners of one thing, or how a project can be collectively funded by saying you know. Because NFTs aren't just J- JPEGs; they can be PDFs or. Uh, mp4 files or a snippet of a movie you know and daming file formats eh because no media nga diba uh, so you know even if you need to fund the film for example you can take a snippet of that film and make it nft and then the collective funding from your nft can actually fund that big project so i've been looking at it in that sense like how, how to produce future works yeah. thank you christine how about you Celine? Um, well, at the moment, I don't know much about NFT as well. I mean, like, I feel like I know as much as they do, like, that it's bad for an environment, but at the same time, it can um, pose as a, this, it, uh, NFTs already have this community, actually, right? Um, I mean, NFT artists do. So, I, I think that it's exciting and, uh, Maybe in the future, yeah, I need to learn more about it. But uh, yeah, I don't uh, entirely close my doors on it. I see. I think the common misconception uh, about NFTs no, is that it's the art itself. When it's just mm. like the digital version mm. of our COA certificate of, our, of authenticity. But I guess what your you, uh, Christina was pointing out earlier, there's a lot of potential. Like uh, you can program it. They say, like, for example, uh, when the artwork gets resold, uh, but supposedly we're going to have five percent for every resale. That's the law, right? But right now we can't monitor, mm-hmm. but through NFTs we can automate it like that. Tapos you can also do like uh, program the artwork. So that it ages, or kaya, uh, parang every year magiiba siya, parang ganon. So, it's a, there's a lot of space for, ano, for imagination nga. So I, I hope, tama, I hope it doesn't just replicate the current art scene na parang lang exactly into digital art. 
And thank you for your insights. Let's check the, uh, uh, the Q&A one. And for students who are watching right now, uh, I would like to ask for them about resources. Naman. How do you find resources or how do you solve the need for various expertise like 3D modeling or the ID generator? Because this is probably not taught in uh, art school, especially pre-med. Mm -hmm. How can you describe your system of support or how do you start, for example? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess for me, for me, nala. <laughs> uh, so with I guess 3D printing itself, um, what I like about it is that how it started to be uh, sort of portable because it used to be like it's just for industrial use, right? And in, uh, like designing these like large scale models or like for like prototyping. But what I like about it is that it had an element of, uh, I guess, an open source community where you can either make your own 3D printer or that you can make your own designs uh, uh, right at your home. So, um, so 3D printers are obviously like really available now in the market. And uh, I guess for the engineers who have helped me, I don't know if I can name one, but Casey, hi Casey Carillo, he's been sort of like a big help also for these types of things. So, in love kasi Casey. So, hello. Um, yeah, so... I guess um, even for yun ya, you multi, I guess multimedia arts graduates. I mean, it's my sort of background na even sa coding, I guess. So maybe you guys can speak <laughs> about that or share. Um, in terms of financial resources, uh, ayun, rumarakit ako sa side. <laughs> Which is... Uh, video and photo documentation ng mga exhibitions. Okay rin siya. Nakatulong siya sa akin na like, makakita ng thoughts ng iba sa, like through their exhibits, through their shows. Tapos, um, well, I've been lucky enough na mag-take up ng multimedia arts. So, like, in a way, meron na rin akong connections na na-establish sa habang nag-aaral pa ako. Di siya so you collaborate. Mm -mm. How about you, Christina? Uh, siguro, uh, same kay Miguel, no? Parang uh, for me, my art practice or formal exhibitions uh, haven't sustained me <laughs> financially or at least not in a stable manner. Parang, you know, there are sales here and there, but it, it's not something stable at all and it's been years so uh, I, I still do freelance work usually graphic design you know the, the google images i hate that are so flat and generic i've had to do a number of those uh, uh web design wordpress they did teach us coding i mean because after i dropped out of pre-med eventually i did multimedia arts in benil which I also dropped out of. Uh, but, but I was able to do classes there for coding. They taught us the languages uh, HTML, Java, uh, PHP, pero nothing connected to the GAN. So, mm. I mean, I guess I had some working knowledge of how coding happens, pero I really learned everything through YouTube. But I think this is really important then, because if I can learn it through YouTube, it's possible that anyone can. You know, they just have to look it up, and they can actually do it also. So that that's a very important part then for me, uh, the the open access nature of things. Uh, when it comes to resources in terms of software, uh, th that's where it gets difficult, because a lot of software or even articles nowadays they're usually hidden behind the paywall. So I, I'm just really lucky to have friends who send me stuff 
or copies of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, to, to find your own community of people who are willing to share things, uh, working knowledge then. Uh, for me, an important resource is actually stepping out of art making and just living life or like going outside of True. your circle and exploring. Yeah. Ang ganda ng mga answers. So, collaboration, um, friends. <laughs> so, help from friends. And then, and take advantage of the technology. Yan. Yung YouTube University natin. It's, there's so much, no? There's so much <laughs> there. As in, parang, sometimes I wonder if, ano, na hindi ko na itutuloy yung thought ko yun. Uh, anyway, um, can you go to the last, siguro last question, ano? There, are there any questions, pa? open questions? Okay, so last question, siguro to wrap, wrap up the conversation. Uh, what opportunities do you see for new media art here in the Philippines? Uh, who would like to start? Si, si Miguel mo na mauna this time. Um, nag-iisipan ko rin to ka, ano pa eh, nung pagka-send ng questions. Um, hmm. For me, tingin ko, we've barely scratched the surface of, ano, I mean, hindi lang dito sa Pilipinas, pati sa other parts of the world. I mean, di pa siya, like, sobrang mainstream. So, like, mahirap pa yung opportunities, I guess. Um, but there are a lot, no? Kailangan lang natin i-pick up. Oo, oh, kailangan lang. Find ano. support. Like How about Celine? Um, well, as by, I mean, by definition, new media art, parang napakalawak niya yung umbrella term din. So, uh, and daming like art forms that relate to new media. I think sound then, right? Um, so I feel like uh, opportunities. It's not that I guess spaces don't, it's not a question of if spaces have spaces for these, more of like if they are willing to cater <laughs> these. Uh, so what is it like? Uh, well, may mga, I mean, I can like think of a, a few artists who already do new media art. And I think it's amazing, but um, what's the future? Like, what, what do I think? Uh, well, I guess it, it's exciting. And I guess what Miguel said, parang it's still parang tipitos pa. <laughs> like, yung mga mm. artists then into doing, I guess, like full on new media art. Wala pa nga atang group exhibition na new puro new media lang eh. So, I mean, for us, like, how about you, Christina? Uh, for me, siguro yung potential na nakikita ko is there's a lot to talk about in the Philippines. Kasi, like what Miguel was saying earlier about BPOs, about the gig industry, about the creative industry, which is being railroaded right now. You know, there's, there's really a lot to talk about. And I think artists, like how I see art, you know, it's a scam, but it's also your method of creating this world where you can talk about these things even if you don't have the most techno capital or even if you don't have the power to enact concrete change agad-agad in the real world. So when we are able to point out the things that are wrong or the things that need to be changed. I think that's where the potential is. Like the, the more we talk about these things, uh, the more we imagine new possibilities. For me, that's what excites me the most. And I'm always happy when I meet people who are able to talk to me about these things or share what they think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, Celine, and Christina. A very exciting times ahead no, for us since you mentioned the, the railroading of the creative industries bill. I really hope it works through para we can be economically stable. Na. So 
thank you for everyone who sent their questions. In case we, we missed any questions, maybe we can forward them to our speakers and they could try answering to another channel. But uh, again, thank you for participating. Uh, honestly, I'm relatively new to appreciating new media works because there's not much of these guys are traditional works. It's uh, traditional is more common here, but every time I encounter excellent works like like yours, uh, the ones you showed me, I'm I'm in awe. Because uh, for me, new media artists, aside from being competent uh, visual artists, they're usually competent researchers, like poets and philosophers. So you are that for me, and. You add so much to to one's life, to your audience life. Because, plus, there's so much room for imagination in this new media. No? So, and that means we're going. So, even though it takes a lot of effort, not even a lot, it takes effort and involvement to understand the work, because the value of new media art is usually not readily apparent, unlike other forms, and unlike traditional forms that focus on technique, for example. I think it's uh, a good embodiment of uh, the essence of contemporary art. So wherein most of the time, the, girl, the, the, the goal is to serve ideas that would help us reflect on the issues that are important to, to me, to us, to our community. So thank you, uh, Celine, Christina, and Miguel. We look forward to seeing thank your you. future works. Salamat. Thank so you. Our, thank you, Carla. Thank you. Salamat. So, to our audience, can... follow them on social media if you haven't already to stay updated on their works. Natin yun sila. So to close our session, may we call on Miss Boots to share with us her thoughts on our discussion. Hi, hi Miss so, Boots. Hi. Thank you again, Carla, um, and Celine, Christina, and Miguel. I just want to read out. Um, a uh, comment posted by Eileen Ramirez, um, who's in the Zoom room. Um, we, she reminds us that at Ateneo Art Gallery, actually um, some years back, I think it was more than 10 years ago, um, had a new media show uh, curated by Fatima Lasay, which featured uh, several artists, among them Poklong, Anadine, um, Boggy was part of that project. Uh, so. Um, in your question earlier, um, what would be the, the appropriate term um, 10 years from now? Um, I think what we use more often is media-based works. You know? So let's drop the new media because it actually is not new anymore. Um, I guess it's also a reflection of the, the art ecosystem that we have, um, which has not yet been very responsive but I believe the fact that there are three artists um, shortlisted in this year's Ateneo Art Awards that, um, whose exhibitions focused on the, the use of media um, um, have very uh, strong media-based practices. Um, that's already a, um, uh, an important um, development. Mo um, also, I would like to add and also to, um, to acknowledge some of the attendees. Uh, we have a number of artists whose practices are also um, e explore um, different me me uh, media. Um, Poklong Anading, I'm not sure if he is still around. Uh, I saw his name, M.M. Vic Balanon, um, among others, uh, um, Neo. Um, uh, Neo also was, was with us. Uh, so these are, that's actually the group of uh, Lost Frames. No? So we're all familiar with their practice. Um, and on, uh, in relation to that, uh, Ateneo Art Gallery actually has a small and growing collection of media-based works in our collection. So we try to, to um, support and have that these different tra trajectories present in our collection. Um, your your sharing was was um, very very enlightening. Um, I think it it underscores the fact that contemporary art practice is both participatory and it's also a process. Um, it 
brings uh, calls to mind um, a recent uh, quote that I came across. Um, I was preparing for um, uh, a presentation or, uh, this morning no? in a, a museum forum. And I would like to use that quote again uh, by Irit Trogov. Um, he notes that artistic practices have become modes of drawing attention to altered conditions and that they make manifest in the world what is urgent and important to our lives. Um, and in line with that, I would like to uh, address this to Christina. You, were, you are by no means being selfish because each of you have um, uh, very personal uh, experiences which you um, share with us and helps us understand what is happening. Um, in different aspects of our lives. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, we look forward to your future projects. Um, I also would like to uh, invite everyone. Uh, we're having our second, uh, our next uh, Art Speak online session. It's actually on October 24. Um, this is in line with the forthcoming print fair which is uh, happening online organized by uh, different uh, groups among them the association of printmakers um ateneo art gallery is sponsoring the session on expanded printmaking part two we had the part one um last may as part of the art fair talks program this time um we have invited Thai artist Kitty Kong Tilokwatan Not Thai. Um, and after his presentation, he will have a conversation with the two artists we featured in the first session, Ambi Abanyo and Juhari Said. So we hope you can join us. Uh, this is a Sunday, actually. No? Um, I think the, the time needs to be adjusted. Um, please, please check the, the updated schedule. It's two to 4 p.m., uh, not 1 to 3 p.m., but that's on a Sunday, and it will be um, live on Zoom and via our Facebook um, uh, page, Atine Art Gallery's Facebook page. The recording of this session will be also made available um, through Facebook and our YouTube channel eventually. So with that, uh, I thank everyone for joining us, and... Um, We'll keep you posted on future programs. Thank you.